Uh, yeah, uh, so it's a pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Professor Bobby Schmidt. He actually only has to pronounce his real title, but I don't know. I'll let, I'll I'm not a professor. But I, 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 love, I love I love it. I love it. I love it. From the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics and Forging. Uh, Bobby is no stranger to these parts and was a uh, Einstein Fellow here from 2012 to 13. Uh, having previously done his PhD at Chicago. Uh, I'm an expert in many uh, many aspects of cosmology and is perhaps best known for his contributions to the theory model of large scale structure. Uh, most of his recent work has focused on understanding these models at the level of the density field of galaxies and matter uh, and how they can be used to robustly extract uh, cosmological information, which he will tell us about today. Right. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Stephen and Tomer, for the kind invitation. And it's great to be back. And it's even great, more great to see that so many people are interested in galaxy clustering. I mean, really super exciting. So um, what I'm gonna talk about is work really done to a large part by these people. Um, I mean, my former student who is now postdoc in Michigan, Andrea, who just finished his PhD and moved, unfortunately left the field, moved to Deep L. Um, Ivana and Beatrice are her PhD students and you as a postdoc. And right, so I will highlight what they've been doing. In the, following. So, so basically, just as a motivation, apparently, I don't need much motivation, right? All of you came to hear about galaxy clustering, but um, it really is historically one of the key probes of cosmology. So even before supernovae, there were papers um, claiming that we need a positive cosmological constant to um, map, to match uh, the scale dependence an amplitude of galaxy clustering um, with, with the uh, CMB quadrupole. But now, of course, what's, um, I guess, exciting most of you is the current um, era of LSS with uh, lots of experiments underway. In particular, DESI is uh, marching along uh, quickly and Euclid was launched in July. So we're very excited about, uh, about these, these surveys. And of course, um, they're delivering huge amounts of data that we want to exploit. Exploit for what? Well, what I like about galaxy clustering is, first of all, we're probing a three-dimensional volume along our past light cone, right? We look back in time as we look out into space. And unlike the CMB, which is a snapshot, galaxy clustering really probes a 3D volume. But in addition, galaxies um, basically have a memory of the history of structure formation of the initial conditions, right? So we can in addition to probing only what's going on here, where we actually see the galaxies, we're actually probing their past history as well, the past history of the universe. So just broadly, what uh, can we do with LSS? Um, starting in time from early to late time, so we can learn about inflation. Um, in particular, the goal would be to reconstruct the statistics of the initial conditions. We can look for interactions of, um, during inflation, for example, look for gravitational waves, even in LSS. Um, then maybe more familiarly, um, dark energy and gravity. So um, the growth of structure, which we probe using galaxies, depends both on the expansion history and on, on gravity, right? So basically, where our goal is to probe both of these. And uh, it's usually parameterized in terms of uh, W not WA, the equation of state of dark energy and the growth rate. <clears throat> so why are these interesting? Um, just as an example, as basically a leading example, I gave, I'm giving here the equation for the linear growth factor that describes how structure evolves on large scales. So basically it's just an overall multiplicative factor because growth is scale independent. And what appears is the Hubble rate and Newton's constant, right? So if we modify the um, dark energy or if we modify gravity, that will appear in this, in this growth. And finally, um, all of structure is dominated by, by dark matter. And so very interesting, um, it's getting increasingly interesting to find out really what dark matter is. Is it <coughs> cold? Is it, is it one or several components? What are, um, what's the sum of neutrino masses? All of these things we can learn about with galaxy clustering. Now, I'm, uh, in my talk, I, I'm not going to talk about actual constraints on all of these things, but just in principle, how do we go about getting at these things? Okay, so, um, so I hope this is in itself interesting enough. <coughs> That's interesting to me because we're faced with two very big challenges um, when we do want to um, make 
progress. First thing is that, um, as I already mentioned, uh, Galaxy surveys, and I'm going to talk only about Galaxy Redshift surveys here, um, deliver a massive amount of data. Okay, they collect sky position and redshifts for millions of galaxies. So our data sets are millions of data points that cover a really substantial fraction of the observable universe. And we, it's kind of hopeless to try to have a model that describes really every single of these galaxy positions. Okay, that's, that's completely uh, unfeasible because first of all, we don't know how to simulate galaxies. I will get to that. And second, uh, we don't know what the initial conditions were that these structures formed from. So um, this is, um, so we have somehow have to compress them, right? Um, so, so how do we compress it? Um, I think cosmology is the ideal application for a Bayes theorem. So I'm gonna do the full Bayesian thing. So let's start with a cosmological model that's characterized by some parameters theta. So for example, lambda CDM, but it could really be anything. Could in principle, and in particular, be beyond lambda CDM because really that's what we want to detect. So a cosmological model does two things. So first, it should predict uh, the statistics of initial conditions. Again, we don't know um, how the universe, uh, what, uh, which area in the universe was overdense, which was was underdense. We only can hope to predict the statistics of that. So that gives us a prior on the initial density field. So for example, inflation, single field slow roll inflation predicts that the initial curvature perturbations are Gaussian um, with a, a scale invariant spectral uh, shape. Okay, so very simple prior to put on the initial condition. And the, th the second part is how does this initial condition field evolve into the final density field? And this is a deterministic classical evolution that we know how to predict. Just think of n body simulations, right? You put in an initial density field and you turn on the evolution and you see how it evolves. And in principle, uh, apart from numerical uh, effects, it gives you a deterministic prediction for what the final field is. So um, by the way, the vectors are an artifact of my previous notation. Please just ignore them. Um, so in the following, um, so I, I was talking um, about a galaxy positions here, right? This is not usually uh, how we deal with the catalogs nowadays. We actually put them on a regular grid for ease of, of computation, okay? So I will do that as well. Uh, so I will think of my data as a galaxy density field discretized on some grid, but you can just think of it as assigning galaxies to itself. <laughs> So, okay, so let's suppose we have this, such a model. We have the prediction. What do we want to do? Um, the full thing to do, the full Bayesian thing to do is to write the posterior as a product of prior and likelihood and marginalize all the parameters um, that, that are unknown, right? And these are particular, the precise initial density field. So again, we have a prior on the initial density field from cosmology, from our cosmological model, which is actually quite simple. It's a multivariate Gaussian. So this is something we can very nicely and easily deal with. But then we have this nasty, uh, nasty conditional probability, right? So this is the conditional probability of the entire galaxy density field given the forward evolved matter density field. And this, of course, contains in particular all the physics of galaxy formation, right? So we don't really expect this to be a simple function we, we can write down in one line, right? This is in general um, a fully nonlinear functional that also depends on the past history of this um, galaxy density field. So it's not just at the final time it will, or at the time of observation. The galaxy density field will depend on the matter density along the entire past history, right? And then finally, even if we have that, right? Suppose we have that, then we're st still faced with this um, marginalization over the initial conditions. So we're marginalizing over a field, which is in principle, infinitely dimensional, infinite dimensional. In practice, it's just very, very high dimensional. So um, it's obviously a difficult problem, right? 
And this is known, the sampling in high dimensions is known as the curse of dimensionality, which typically means uh, samplers are getting increasingly inefficient in, in high dimensions. So what we've done so far in the field is to abandon this idea of really writing the full, sampling the full posterior, and we compress the data into some recipient space. And there's a good motivation for that because if we assume that the forward model is purely linear, right? So delta forward is just basically this growth factor I mentioned times the initial density field. And if addition, this condition probability, which I said would be very complex, of course, in general, but if we would just approximate as Gaussian, then we can perform this integral analytically. It's a Gaussian integral because this is Gaussian, this is Gaussian, so there's just a um, compounding of two Gaussians. We can perform the integral and what we obtain. This is actually a very useful exercise for those of you, maybe uh, for students, for example, who are new in this field and want to understand a bit of the statistics, just do this computation, um, Gaussian integrals. You will find that the power spectrum contains all information. So in other words, the posterior becomes a function of the data only via this compressed function, this galaxy power spectrum. So that's, of course, a very neat result because it tells us, OK, I, I get all the information if I uh, compress the data into this one statistic. So this is the motivation, really, for why we've been looking at the power spectrum and large scale structure. Here's an example um, of BOSS. Um, a power spectrum of luminous red galaxy galaxies. Um, hopefully, uh, many of you have seen that. Um, of course, uh, in reality, we know this cannot be, I mean, we can still use it, um, the power spectrum, but it definitely only has a subset of the information. Of course, the key question is how big is that subset? Is it 50%? Is it 30%? Is it 80%? And, uh, and so we want to go beyond that. And why in, uh, do we want to go beyond that um, is so apart from the principal question of um, getting more information, there is this annoying fact that as we go to smaller scales, we need to make our prediction reliable. We need to add more and more free parameters. So I will, I'm jumping ahead of myself a bit here and already going to the model I will describe next, but basically, this model I'll describe, we can go systematically to, to higher order and push systematically into more nonlinear scales. But that forces us to introduce of order um, seven free parameters whose shape contribution are all very similar and it's illustrated here. And so basically, uh, instead of actually allowing us to get more information by going to smaller scales, we just, you know, basically our free parameters blow up the error bars. So what do we do instead? Well, uh, perhaps the most straightforward thing um, from a theorist's perspective is to go to the next higher endpoint function, which will be the three-point function, or in Fourier space, the bispectrum. So this is uh, a plot from the paper by Misha Ivanov et al, um, where they used one loop, I'll get to that, uh, power spectrum plus bispectrum up to four learned perturbations, and they get, you know, so, so what you can see is that um, the red contours do, um, uh, so I actually, yeah, so this is um, not the perfect plot because it's only illustrating the effect of higher bispectrum multiples. Um, but basically, the constraint on sigma 8 is improved on the order by 30 of 30% 30 by including the bispectrum. So roughly, um, you end up with constraints on H0. For example, in the context of lambda CM of order one point something percent and of sigma eight of order four and a half percent. So just as a benchmark for, for my results that I'll show you later. So right, so I tried to argue why the power spectrum is 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 not enough or why we should go beyond that. And then you can um, think of doing the bi spectrum and higher endpoint functions, but we really to keep in mind that we have all the structure here, right? And somehow we want to do more than just compress it into ever higher endpoint functions. We want to get kind of at the field. So let's try to do that. Let's try to not compress 
the data and instead really tackle this head on and do the full explicit marginalization over initial conditions. So the, the idea it would be to, uh, how do we do this in practice if you really want to do it? We assume that we can discretize all the fields. As I already mentioned for the data, we do the same for all of our fields, right? So we have a fields on lattices, then we have, recall we have the prior of the initial conditions. So for a given cosmological parameter set, I draw an initial conditions field from my prior, I forward evolve it, I evaluate the likelihood, and then in principle, I can do a classic MCMC except reject step, right? Um, so in principle, this is straightforward Monte Carlo uh, Markov chain integration. The problem is just we're in a million dimensional parameter space and the likelihood that you'll get in a sample accepted from any given point is um, infinitesimal, truly infinitesimal. Um, so you will never move anywhere just by doing MCMC. But there are very nice techniques uh, called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo that actually allow us and now many uh, generalizations even uh, exist. Um, so there are techniques that exploit the gradient of this likelihood to move um, in this high dimensional space over a finite distance while still retaining an acceptable likelihood. And that allows you, rather than just doing a random walk, you actually walk along uh, surfaces of constant posterior, essentially. And then you're much more likely to find an example that's acceptable. Should, should we think of these millions of parameters, as it were, as the amplitude of each of the Fourier modes? Yes, or, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, in the initial conditions. In the initial conditions. And that's presumably all the, the biasing physics and all that stuff. And then, in addition, you have the cosmological parameters and nuisance or physical parameters, really, that enter this likelihood, which I haven't even mentioned yet. <laughs> and one other question, the discretization onto the grid I mean, you have redshift space distortions, and so the grid, the grid itself is going to be affected by that. Or do we right. think about this grid in redshift space or real space, or how, how should we think about that? Both. Yeah. So redshift, uh, real space to redshift space is mapping from one grid to another. So one thing you might already wonder is how do I choose the grid size, right? So it's basically the resolution. What resolution should I look at? For the data, what resolution should I choose for my initial conditions? And that's indeed a, a very important question. In general, um, your model will depend um, on what the grid size is. So you have to basically adjust your model to absorb different grid sizes, right? Um, it doesn't make sense to have a model that says galaxies live on 10.5 megaparsec grids. The real galaxies don't live on that grid, right? So you're your inference has to be independent of this choice. <laughs> um, I just want to mention, yeah, that um, by after pioneering work by Paco Kitaura and Jens Yasha, there's been quite a bit of interest in this. So they already in 2011, 2012, they were working on this where it was even much more futuristic than now. So um, really visionary work. So, okay, so let's make, so let's go forward. Um, Let's assume, okay, we can do this HMC, right? I still don't have the physics yet, right? I need this additional probability of the galaxy density given, given the matter density. The matter density evolution, I can basically predict from simulations, for example, or from perturbation theory, but what is this probability for galaxy formation? And here it's really, uh, I always like to put this slide somewhere in my talks because like if people, people used to thinking about the CMB, it's, it's really a completely different story, right? So if we measure the CMB on the right-hand side, for example, we're measuring small perturbation on top of perfect black body, right? So really everything is close to equilibrium, close to linear. It's a beautiful system that can be solved essentially at linear order. I mean, there's no need to go beyond linear work. For galaxies, this is very different, right? So here is uh, one of the first images by Euclid. Very nice. I'm very happy to see that it's working. Um, the Perseus cluster. So here, every single photon we observe is the result of an extremely complicated process, right? 
um, star formation, first of all, stars assembling to galaxies, feedback processes, dust obscuration, all of these things are mixed in there together and we cannot go back and undo this, right? This is in the data, so we have to deal with it. So I already had a couple slides I mentioned perturbation theory. Um, so that's the route we'll be going. So, but, but I wanna explain how this works and why this works, right? So, so how does structure form in the universe and how do galaxies form in the structure? So fortunately, we're in this very nice situation that on large scales, the only force we have to contend with is gravity, right? Basically, non-gravitational interactions, um, galaxy formation, star formation happens on relatively small scales. All of all, everything that's larger scales is purely gravity. So essentially, the zeroth order approximation to the problem is the evolution of cold collisionless matter under gravity. And this cold collisionless matter here is CDM plus baryons, right? So sometimes people talk about these simulations as being dark matter only. That's, that's not true. They have baryons, but they neglect non-gravitational forces. And, and so this is the, known as the vlasov poisson system and can be beautifully and very efficiently solved using M-body simulations. And this is the result. So you basically start with typical initial conditions that I already mentioned, scale invariant uh, and adiabatic and Gaussian, and you let gravity do its thing and you get this result. <coughs> Again, um, the, the Gaussian adiabatic fluctuations are extremely well motivated by inflation and the CMB. So what, what do we see from this result, right? So what you can already see by eye kind of is that large scale fluctuations are small. That is, they're still small because basically you can see that this area, this quadrant has the same mean density as this, right? There's no dramatic large scale gradients here. So large uh, scale fluctuations are small, actually still linear today, if you go to significantly large scales and the growth is scale invariant. And the scale invariant simply follows from the fact that there's only gravity and no other scale in the problem. There's no sound horizon, there's no gene scale because it's only gravity. And then structure forms hierarchically, first collapsing on small scales and then to progressively larger and larger scales. And this is completely general for any, um, I mean, uh, we can really vary, go quite a bit away from Lambda CDM and this still holds this picture. So this is quite trustworthy. This is another way of illustrating this. This is now the amplitude for the variance amount of fluctuations per logarithmic wave number interval. So these are small scales, these are large scales. And what you can see, and the different lines show different redshifts, right? So you can see that everything is growing proportionally. That's the scale independent growth. And you see there's a characteristic scale at each redshift where this line crosses one. And that's the scale where you expect cost, um, structure to become nonlinear, right? But if we're working on scales out here, typical density perturbations are 10 to minus two percent level or up to 0.1, what depending on the scale. So uh, we have a regime where um, structure is formation is perturbative, and now we just need to figure out how how to put galaxies in there. So how do we do this? Um, so the goal is basically to say, um, okay, I, I really don't understand how galaxies form, but I do know that they form out of matter and that um, they fall along, fall along with matter uh, as they form because that's <clears throat> simply equivalence principle. And I know that there is that the formation happens on small spatial scales. Okay. And then the idea is to use just these assumptions and formulate things in such a way that I can absorb all possible um, galaxy formation physics into a finite number of free coefficients that I then infer together with my cosmology. And that way I absorb a galaxy formation physics into the coefficients along with my cosmology inference. And I basically marginalize over all plausible ways that galaxies could have formed. So how do we do this? Technically, um, this is for the more theory-minded people. Um, so what we do is we introduce a cutoff lambda 
And that defines our notion of what are large scale and small scale perturbations. So perturbations below lambda are large scale. I call this my um, large scale density contrast delta lambda and the whole rest is small scale delta s. And then the idea is I want to integrate out these small scale moments. Notice that I put the cutoff in the initial perturbations, not the evolved perturbations. And the reason is because recall that the initial perturbations are Gaussian. So that means their covariance is diagonal in Fourier space. So I can neatly decompose them, right? The prior on the initial conditions factorizes into large scale, small scale moves. Not the posterior for sure. Of course, that will be much more complicated. So basically then there are two, um, two basic ways that this marginalization produces um, additional terms. One is the explicit dependence of the galaxy density on these large scale perturbations. These are captured by these fields that I call O of X. And the hope is to have a finite number of these and I allow free coefficients, but only the coefficients are free, right? So that it, as long as these O are a function of the large scale modes, which I keep explicitly, I know exactly how to compute these. And then the small scale perturbations um, have basically a, a kind of a noise, noise contribution. So this could be a whole, um, at least an hour long talk is how do we just construct bias? Um, it's basically um, including all the dependence of the galaxy density on the matter density on tidal field, as well as time and space derivatives thereof. But uh, this still, thanks to perturbation theory, gives us um, the finite number of terms. And in particular, the fact that we can include all time derivatives using a finite number of terms is kind of a mir miracle. Um, but that goes back to the fact that growth is scale invariant. So I'm happy to discuss this, this more. <coughs> Um, there's also a nice uh, thing about we once we introduce this explicit cutoff, we can do running of the bias terms with respect to the cutoff. Gives us another way to uh, it's basically our, our G flow and this bias parameter space. Um, happy to talk about this also if people are interested. Let's get this. So okay, so fine. We have these bias coefficients multiplying fields that I know how to construct. So it's kind of deterministic. Uh, for a given set of bias terms, but I also have this noise field, right? So I need to, I need to know what this noise does. And this is uh, much well, less well known, even in the technical community of LSS theory. So, so how do we describe this noise? Um, physically, it arises from the superposition of many small scale perturbations that we're integrating out. So it's many because we're working on large scales, each large scale patch has a huge number of small scale perturbations that add up within it, if we cross grain over it. So the central limit theorem says that if I average over sufficiently many of these independent perturbations, the result should be Gaussian distributed. That's great, right? So I can, I have a starting point, right? I can work with distribution that's at lowest order is Gaussian. And then the second major point is that, again, galaxy formation is local in real space, which uh, means that I um, can expand the power spectrum that describes my Gaussian likelihood powers of k squared. So this is a bit technical, but um, my main message here is that I can even absorb the complete characterization of this noise field epsilon into a finite number of terms, the shot noise amplitude uh, derivative corrections and so on. So it's still a finite number of terms. Good. So how do we now construct the likelihood? Uh, it's now basically we have everything we need. Um, well, move a bit faster here, but basically um, we have our data model, which again consists of the sum over bias terms that are functionals, but known functionals of the large scale perturbations plus noise, and the noise has a Gaussian PDF, right? field level PDF. So now I can just uh, insert this relation into the noise and analytically integrate out the noise. 
And that gives me my field level likelihood, which becomes really deceptively simple, right? So given a matter density field, what is the probability for my galaxy density field? It's just a mode by mode um, addition of the individual um, Gaussian likelihoods with the sigma of K basically given by the noise amplitude. So here, again, I'm comparing mode by mode the data with this deterministic bias prediction. Sorry, I'm a little lost. The, yes. Doing this mode by mode, but the quantity sigma depends on the noise and that noise term, not on the initial Barrett's factor. Exactly, because um, that is capturing the modes that we've integrated out, right? The small scale modes okay. above the cutoff that we've integrated out. Okay. Those are inside here. And those basically lead to this uncertainty <laughs> in, in our model prediction, right? If we didn't integrate out any modes, we should have, this should be a direct delta, right? There should be no noise, except for the photon noise in our detector. And, but the key point is, of course, that we, our model is constructed at the scale lambda, so we should definitely not compare um, the data above lambda. And this, is, this cut is easily implemented in this, in this formulation. Good, so now we have everything, right? So we, so what do we do? Um, let's see, um, this is a little bit technical, but uh, I'm not gonna explain the details. So basically um, we start, we sample an initial density field um, from our prior, put the cutoff at lambda. Then we forward evolve using Lagrangian perturbation theory because everything is perturbative, the biosic expand is perturbative. <coughs> There's no need to use simulations. I can just use perturbation theory at the same order. <clears throat> we construct our bias fields. And then the um, prediction for the galaxy density is just the sum of our bias fields times the coefficients. And then I plug that into likely. And I re repeat that many, many times coupled to an HMC sampler. Right. The Halo catalog or Galaxy catalog is the same, just um, just applying the cutoff at lambda. So one thing um, that I maybe should, um, it's a bit technical, but let me mention it. <clears throat> the fact that I have a finite volume for my data list and the finite cutoff means I have a finite number of modes that I need to treat, right? So from the beginning, I can choose my grid size is basically determined by the cutoff, I just need to make sure that all the large scale modes fit on my grid. And I never have to worry about any dependence of the result on my grid sizes. Okay, everything is just a function of this cutoff lambda. But of course, the cutoff is artificial. So any cosmological parameter should be independent of lambda. Any bias parameters should run according to this RG flow that I flashed. So, so we have a well-defined way that everything should depend on lambda. What are these bias parameters? I, I did not get that part. Yeah, I skipped. I mean, it's basically powers of the matter density field, powers of the tidal field, and some additional terms that incorporate the fact that um, you have long time scales. Um, so basically, the, you incorporate the history of galaxy formation as well. But we know exactly how to uh, construct them at any order. But only using gravity because you mentioned that we don't have any others. Yeah, very good. Um, so, what about non gravitational forces? Yes, very good point. So, basically, uh, non gravitational forces um, exist and they come, but they come with an additional spatial scale, like the gene scale, right? Pressure effects will be uh, active over gene scale, feedback effects will be active over where, whatever length scale associated with the momentum feedback or radiation feedback. So basically you expand additionally in derivatives. So then your theory is only valid outside of this, this scale. And hopefully that's not too large, but this is um, definitely also a worry that we- The lambda has to be larger than Yeah, so, so basically we're only, we can only look at gas clustering on larger scales than this feedback scale. It certainly also holds if you use simple HODs, and then, but that's a separate topic. Just to be clear, so yes. the, the B, B capital O and the sigma i's are also free parameters. Yes. Determine yes. In your end. Everything jointly determined. Together with the cosmic Yes. 
the practice, we use the HMC only for the initial conditions and then a slice sampler for the other parameters um, because of a gigantic hierarchy between the gradients of the two. So, uh, but this is also technical, but kind of important. Um, any more questions on this? Well, since you you don't know about the you know non gravitational physics, if you go back a few slides. So, so yeah, unfortunately, I removed the slide about. Um, um, <laughs> so where you have you know, your noise, are you basically just choosing your grid scale so that whatever essentially to be large enough so that you're not summing over k that would be, you know. Uh, um, but but it still is affecting the essentially the noise from those scales. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah. Without pressure effects, we wouldn't have. Um, without baryonic physics, we wouldn't have stars. Right. So if you go to your sum of the Gaussians. Um, this. No, no, no. Further, further. Further. This. Uh, further. Yeah. Here. Right. So. I mean, that sigma at a given k, you're summing it over all of the, so this is the sum over the. Uh, Sorry, I should have, um, uh, I should have, re I removed the expression, but the sigma is basically a constant, plus a term that scales as k squared and k to the fourth and so on. And so your question, I think, is what is the scale that controls how big these k squared effects are? And I would say it's the same as the scale that basically the spatial size of the region that where, where that influences galaxy formation, right? So, um, for example, uh, for halos, we know this is the conservative limit is the Lagrangian radius because all the dark matter particles that make up the halo come originally from the Lagrangian radius. So everything outside that is basically, um, if you're outside of that, you can treat everything as local dependence. So for galaxies, feedback effects could act on longer scales. And we hope that this is not the case because otherwise we need to explicitly mold them, which I think is gonna be a major challenge for, for any model of galaxy clustering for cosmology. So basically, yeah, then there would be an additional length scale that would be quite large and we would be restricted to really large scales. The one thing I'm worried about is ionizing radiation, right? So if your galaxy formation at some point depends on the ionization state of the gas, and that depends on local UV background, and the UV mean free path is 100 megaparsec, that will be very bad, right? So, and this, I mean, we have worked on this a bit and trying to model this. It's very, very difficult, but we have good, I mean, it's, it's going to be a very small amplitude effect, right? So probably uh, because you have also this averaging effect, right? So if you have a sphere over 100 megaparsec, the fluctuations and the UV background average over that sphere are going to be quite small. So um, yeah, this is an ongoing um, point that we um, we need to worry about. This is probably the biggest caveat. Is there a way to, to quantify, to sort of put in some unknown amplitude from noise amplitude from the scale, from the physics that you're basically- Right, I mean, you could just, um, well, we infer basically the scale, right? When we, do, when we leave these parameters free, we infer the scale. Um, but it's tricky if you have two scales, one with a, a small length scale, but that has really big nonlinearities, like say the Lagrangian radius, and then another large scale that has very small modulations. Because at the level of the k square and k to the fourth, at the level of k square term, they would look the same. So um, it's it's tricky. It's possible, but it's it's tricky. And I think we will need physical arguments. Also, we will need insights from simulations. Unfortunately, these things are also very hard to simulate because you need to follow these effects over very long time scales. Yes. Don't you need to? Take into account this cross correlation between scales in the variance, like super sample variance, like living in over. Oh, yeah, yeah, very good point. Right. So, here I'm strict. So, basically, um, right, I have the galaxy 
you know, survey volume like this. In principle, I can make my box bigger and bigger, right? As I'm talking, we as big as the whole universe, and then super sample is incorporated. Mm -hmm. This is very inefficient. So we don't want to do that. We probably want to choose a box that's just a bit bigger than a volume and then put in super sample into the forward model, which we know how to do. So that's that's possible. For example, allowing for curvature in your cosmological parameters, and then you just measure the effective curvature. <laughs> more questions so let's see um where was i here this is just a snapshot um of a full inference pipeline run on mock data that we generated or andrea generated from the same models um left side is the ground truth density field middle panel is the reconstructed prediction predicted signal so these are not the initial conditions um, we can also plot the initial conditions, but they're Gaussian, so they're categorical. Um, and this is the residual, which is so everything as expected. So this, to me, is a significant science game, right? To have these reconstructed initial conditions, because what you can do, you can do lots of cross-correlation studies, for example, kinetic SE effects. So Min has a nice paper where he used reconstruction from uh, such a yeah, and so initial condition samples from such a reconstruction to correlate with CMB, to, um, with optimal kinetic SE estimator. You can correlate with CMB lensing. You can correlate with systematics, known systematics to check if you have any um, systematics imprint in your inference. So this is a major additional science, okay. Right, so one thing I wanted to mention is um, simulation-based inference, which is a very hot topic right now. So basically what we have, right, for our full entrance pipeline is a fast generator of mock data or simulated data because we can just sample from this likelihood, right? It's an explicit likelihood. We have our forward model. It's very straightforward to sample from it. And then the idea, which is uh, Beatrice's work, is to, instead of trying to infer the full, full field, let's just uh, go back to summary statistics. <laughs> But I don't write, want to write an explicit, complicated model for my power spectrum, in particular by spectrum. I just want to take it from, um, from directly from simulated data. Right? And the way it works is you um, you train a neural uh, normalizing flow, a deep neural network, to estimate the joint density of your data vector and cosmological parameter vector, and then you evaluate that on the observed data to get your parameter posterior. The nice thing about this approach is that we can put in like systematics, window functions, um, all of these things directly into the forward model, whereas they're generally quite cumbersome to put into um, the data, into a model for the data vector. Um, so here are some results. I'm just kind of flashing them there. Consider basically, Beatrice showed that basically consistent with what you get from MCMC on a Gaussian likelihood. So, so far, I mean, no surprises there. So this is as measured off of real data. No, no, this is uh, this is also from mock data because we don't have okay. in this case we don't have any mask and no register space historians. Okay. So right. Um, one caveat: um, this is um, the error bar inferred on. Actually, I think it was sigma eight. Must be sigma eight. Um, as a function of the number of simulations used in training the normalizing flow. And you see that we reach convergence only around 10 to the five simulations. So this is, we, I'm sure we can optimize this more. Um, you can do hyperparameter tuning, you can do um, ensemble averaging. Um, but I mean, we do, will probably need a lot of simulations for this SPI um, approach. Another important thing though, is that you see that generally the constraints tend to be conservative when you don't have enough simulations. So this is kind of, I mean, there's no theorem that guarantees that, but it seems more often than not to be the case. And this is kind of, um, this is a nice property actually, because um, if you stop at some finite number, at least you won't be overly aggressive. Whereas if you have an MCMC chain and it's not long enough, you will underestimate your errors. Yeah. Um, you mentioned 10 to the five is, is kind of a limiting number, but if you just in the, 
prior sampling and marginalization, you have 10 to the six dimensions, then don't you need to run a significantly larger number for the field level inference of simulations? So, so here we're not interested, um, actually, perfect, perfect question for this. So uh, we are not inferring any field level information here, right? We're just trying to infer cosmological parameters and these bias parameters. So our data vector is maybe 100 elements, our parameter vector is 10 elements. So then you can live with a smaller number of simulations. If you wanted to do SBI on the field level and explicitly infer every single initial conditions mode, that is going to be extremely challenging. I, yeah, I don't see this. I mean, we need new ideas to do that. So I think there is um, a lot of, in this field, which has a huge number of, amount of momentum, it's great that there's so many things going on, but there's also quite a bit of confusion. So I wanted to like kind of disambiguate at least the way I see it. So to me, forward modeling is just a, a general term for using a simulator. In, my, in our case, it's just the random perturbation theory of the observed data in the inference, right? Um, so you can do that to, for example, simulate your mean data vector, or you can do SBI on it, and your data vector can be anything, for example, also endpoint functions, right? On the other hand, field level inference is kind of a different, it's a completely, it's an orthogonal statement. So it says that we're trying to infer cosmology using, or whatever, physics, using the full galaxy density field without any compression and hence obtain a joint posterior of the initial conditions and cosmology. So it's not simply, um, so if you train a, a network to compress your observed data to some numbers and you apply that network to the data, that to me is not field level inference because you're not, it's just another way of um, writing down summary statistics, right? So uh, field level really means the strong inference and why is that important? Because it guarantees that you get optimal constraints. If you do any compression, you're never guaranteed to get optimal constraints. Um, of course, optimal always in the sense of, in the context of the model. And so this is where my remark to the um, to next question. So to my knowledge, this is at this point, field level inference is only feasible use an explicit field level likelihood of not using simulation-based inference, but maybe people will come up with ways to do it. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, so, so yeah, how should I, should I talk about? So maybe a, a poll. So, so the first thing, <laughs> so one thing is, um, I can talk about is inferring sigma eight from halos and simulations where we fix the initial conditions to the ground truth. That's basically a validation of how accurate our model is in inferring cosmology, but not how um, precise our statistical error bars are because it's applied in simulations. The other thing is um, retrospace distortions, all the retrospace distortions. And then finally, I have some first results where we actually vary the initial conditions. So who's, um, maybe anyone saying, who, anyone interested in anything particular? But just space distortions, perhaps. Okay. So, yeah, should write the only one. <laughs> right. um, yeah, if anyone is interested in this kind of results, like, for, like uh, anyway, I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, assembly bias, very interesting. Also happy to talk about it. The AO, I'll flash something at the end. Um, so retrospace distortion. So, I mean, the main point here is that, so what, is, what are retrospace distortions? It's a very simple thing. Uh, our, we infer our galaxy distances using redshifts. Redshifts contain a cosmological term, which is what we want, plus a peculiar velocity term. A peculiar velocities, correlate with large scale structure because they're due to gravity. So we have to incorporate them in our model. And if you do the classic summary statistics, it's very complicated because you have a nonlinear coordinate transform and everything becomes extremely messy. In our case, right, we have these fields um, in, the, in the rest frame of the fluid, 
and we have the velocity also, right? Everything is available in the forward model. So all we have to do is, is basically construct this bias field and then move it to redshift space using the velocity. And the nice thing is we can also put in the fact that galaxy velocities are unbiased, so we obtain additional information. That said, galaxy bias are galaxy bias are unbiased, but velocity bias is important. Um, so what are these things here? Are precisely these higher derivative effects um, that we're asked. So basically, if you have um, ramp pressure and you know pressure effects in general, will introduce a difference between galaxy velocities and matter velocities. Um, but that is basically suppressed on large scale. So we put this in precisely. And so Yulia was able to, again, on halos, but in redshift space, um, also in matter in redshift space, but using the fixed initial conditions was able to get back the growth rate down to about a percent or two. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's clearly harder than uh, in real space, but we do have a model that I think will, will perform. And of course, this can also, I mean, this is ongoing work. We don't have to do this at the field level. We can, again, now from this model, generate mock catalogs in redshift space and compute galaxy power spin and bias spectrum redshift space, do SBI on that. This is immediately possible. OK, so um, you know, I want to, I'd rather have some time for discussion. So uh, let me focus on. The last couple of points, which are how much information there is once we allow, um, once we do this marginalization over initial conditions, which is in the end what I promised in the talk title. I didn't show that the sigma eight error bar is much less than one percent for fixed phases, but it um, um, doesn't matter here. So here's a result that Min got from um, mock catalogs that were generated blind catalogs. So um, and we had this workshop in Aspen last year where uh, we decided it would make sense to have a blind challenge where people working on different beyond two-point function summary statistics could submit their results without knowing the true cosmology. And it, we have very interesting findings. So this is led by Yosuke Kobayashi, Andres Salcedo, and Elizabeth Krause. Um, and they were actually willing to also prepare catalogs that take into account the various different states of evolution of these methods. So for example, Misha Ivanov's pipeline is of course ready to be applied to data. Our pipeline, we don't have, there's a lot of things we don't yet have. So they created simplified catalogs for us. And what you see here is our inferred um, sigma eight at the field level, including modes up to 0.1 inverse megaparsec. And this is to be compared to the cost of the spy spectrum analysis, um, Misha Ivanov's pipeline going to a substantially larger K values. And we see we do have smaller error bars. It's not a completely fair comparison because of different noise treatments. So this is not the end of the story, but it, I do think there's quite a bit of additional information to be had. And that's, of course, um, very motivating, motivating to us. Um, Another uh, result, this is uh, now mock catalogs that we ourselves constructed uh, from Ivana's um, BAO inference. On the right-hand side, you see the statistical error bar on the inferred BAO scale. Um, if we compare, I mean, you don't, of course, we're, we want to compare this with a classical BAO analysis that's ongoing, but just um, as a ballpark estimate, I put the boss numbers here. So we do uh, hope to have some significant improvement over standard analyses also, um, but this is still work in progress. So um, just to recap, um, again, happy to be here forever for, for discussions. Um, so I hope <laughs> I could convince you about a little bit about, or convey a little bit about why galaxy clustering is such a complex data set. Um, and how we can face this challenge. So we wrote this left field code, which is um, that all these results I showed are based on fast and differentiable EFT based forward model or simulator, which we can use for SBI or field level inference. 
And um, the plan is to, of course, eventually get dark energy constraints, which I couldn't talk about at all because we don't have them yet. Um, but BIO, RSD, and inflation via FNL, I think are very interesting targets for this, this method. And we do plan to release it um, probably next year. So thank you. We have, well, we're kind of on the time, but we, we, we start a bit late, so what would we pause for a few questions? You stress the role of judiciously choosing your scale lambda down to which you do the analysis. Is there a way to imagine doing that iteratively where you vary lambda and use some self consistency checks in the data analysis itself to tell you when you should? Stop making it smaller. Uh, excellent point. Yeah. So, um, so one approach is to to as you said vary lambda, and then first of all you want to see that uh, your the central values of your cosmological bias parameters don't shift, and that the bias parameters the cosmological parameters shouldn't shift, and the bias parameters should run according to the theory prediction which we can calculate. The problem in practice is that, of course, your statistical error bar becomes larger. And so you're always, I mean, you, you will see a shift, but then a larger error bar. So, so the, the ideal thing, the robust thing to do would be to stick to fixed scale and then go to a higher order of perturbations. And you want to see convergence in that. This is what this plot is showing. So um, if you look at a fixed point on the x-axis, which is basically the way to sort halo um, samples, and you look at the different orders, we want to see that as I increase the order, I eventually get to a, the ground truth in this case, which of course we don't have in the real universe, but we see that the points converge to consistent values, right? Up here, it's, for example, uh, it's less clear, right? These are more highly biased samples. So here, if I find this in real data, I wouldn't necessarily trust it. But if I'm here, I see that two over D, three, fourth, fifth order, all stick together, then I would be pretty confident. So <clears throat> this would be the ideal case. Now going to higher orders in the stand, the classic approach where you do the explicit loop integrals is a huge amount of work. Um, people telling me uh, like um, one more loop is one year of work. <laughs> so, um, so this is of course not feasible, but in this approach, it's just um, an iterative scheme. So just computation time. Yeah. Uh, but in your initial condition, I don't remember if you said it was scale independent, but it, does that mean you're assuming the spe scalar spectral index one or that the volume um, is zero? Uh, no, no, this is just uh, just approximately scale bearing. This was just the talking quality, right? Okay. So here so far we're fixing. So the way it works is technically is we generate a unit Gaussian random field. And then we multiply by a transfer function, which is just square root of the linear power spectrum. So there we can put in anything. Currently, we're putting in just a fixed cosmology, but of course, it will be easy to couple to class and generate that from class if it's fast enough. So that, that's the way how you would put in things like um, NS dependence and omega and dependence. So this. Uh, in practice, we right, are actually observing, you know, density fields that are have all sorts of selection effects through, you know, the experiments, what we've targeted the redshift surveys off of. Do you imagine sort of incorporating those into the forward modeling or still doing sort of data level corrections uh, first and then running this on sort of the corrected catalogs or how do you envision that? Um, by the way, we lost the Zoom somehow, but I'm not sure. Um, I seem to be offline, I don't know why. Anyway, uh, this is an excellent point. And we, um, as we develop this approach, we need to work on this, right? Um, we need to think both from the observer side and from modelers or theorists side, how we incorporate systematics. Um, I, probably in the end, it will be a mix. Some of them will be incorporated in the forward model, others in, um, others in systematic weights. But in general, of course, as a Bayesian, systematic weights are not so nice, right? Um, you want to do better than that. 
Uh, but on the plus side, so this will be quite a bit of work, I think, and it will require a complete new set of validations. But we have also many additional tests, right? We can, as I mentioned, if we do a reconstruction and inference, we can correlate the density field with a systematics map and should give zero, right? If we find something, then we know there's still some systematic there. We can also cut out, for example, locate transverse modes that are basically only on the sky um, because we, that's what we expect for the metric systematics to do. If you do that in power spectrum analysis, you lose almost all the signal or a large part of the signal. At the field level, I would expect you lose much less signal. So, um, so that's, that's another approach to do. Um, so that's kind of a mode projection kind of thing. But I, I believe, yeah, we need to really start that conversation if we want to go this route. Uh, let's thank uh, Fabian again. Thank you.